morning, everybody. If you're a guest here today, my name is Wes. I'm one of the pastors. It is so good to be in the house of the Lord, and the house is full. All right. I am so glad that you are here today as we are wrapping up this series called Dare to Dream. This week, I was uh, remembering a story that I heard that a guy wrote a long time ago. He was a famous writer by the name of Kierkegaard, and he envisioned a village where only ducks lived. So here's what I want you to do. If you would picture in your mind's eye the bird from the Aflac commercial. You know the commercial, right? <laughs> Aflac, yes, this, this message brought to you today by Aflac. No, I'm not uh, for real on that. But if you would just envision in your mind a town where only ducks lived, and here's how he told the story. That one day on Sunday, all of the ducks left their homes and they waddled down to church. And then they all waddled in and they filled up all of the seats. And soon the duck choir came in and they all waddled up and they began to sing. And soon the duck minister went up and he read from the duck Bible and he had this message to proclaim. He said, attention ducks. He said, you have wings. You can fly. He said, there is no wall that can contain you. There is no obstacle that can stop you, for God has given you wings, and you can fly. And at this, all of the ducks were delighted. They said, amen, right? Or Aflac, I guess. I don't know what they said. <laughs> Hallelujah, right? Uh, preach it, they, they said. And then the most amazing thing happened as everybody was so inspired. All of the ducks were inspired, and then they all waddled out of the church, and they waddled down Main Street, and they waddled back to their homes until the next Sunday when they waddled back and did it all again. That's the story that Kierkegaard tells, and I love that story because it's often been representative of my life. I hear the good news that God's given me wings to fly. He's given me a vision uh, to live for in my life, to live my life at a different altitude than I've been living before I met Jesus. And I came to Jesus and said in my brokenness, I need you, Lord, I need you every hour. I need you. And you know what happens to me, though, is even though I know that, so many times I will just waddle home. Am I alone? So many times I'll find myself floundering instead of flying. That's why I need to be with you here in the house of the Lord. And that's why I need again today to say to Jesus, I need you. Oh, I need you. Every hour I need you. Am I alone? Anybody else feeling that way in your life? You're, you're tired of waddling through the dust. And you're ready to live life at a different altitude. Can I tell you how that journey starts? It starts when you say yes to Jesus and accept the gift of his salvation and grace and forgiveness in your life. There is nothing finer. There is no better news than I have to tell today except that Jesus saves. Thanks be to God for his amazing grace. And out of response and gratitude to this grace, can I tell you then what God invites us to do? Because it gets even better is that God invites us to live our life on mission for him. He invites us to dare to dream and to follow his way. And it's a, it's a way that's going to honor God. It's going to bless other people. And it's going to bring you and me joy. When we live our life on mission for God, it is exciting. It is thrilling. It is the great adventure. You know, this uh, week, I know that uh, many of you didn't waddle home after church last Sunday. Uh, we've been in this series called Dare to Dream, and if you weren't here last week, I want to encourage you to go online and watch Pastor George's message on Dare to Dream as he challenged us to take pen and put it to paper and listen to God and say, Lord, speak to me, and then to write down what the Lord says is our God-sized mission. And it might not be perfect, and you might change it, but just to begin to write down, what is God speaking? And I got some great news, because many of you, you, you soared home, and God has given you uh, some, some wings to fly with in your life. Look, listen to what some people wrote this week. They sent us some emails, and one person said, my God-sized mission is working with parents to find their way through the school system when they have a student with a disability. That's good stuff, wouldn't you agree? Somebody else said, my God-sized mission is to bring a smile and some happiness to those dealing with loss, especially sadness, depression, and anxiety. 
And I didn't write that, but whoever you are, uh, as one who is a grateful Christian in recovery from depression and anxiety, I'm looking forward to your smile. So I look forward to seeing you later. My life mission, another person said, is to help the elderly with mental and physical disabilities live their life with respect and the dignity that they deserve to the glory of God. Good stuff. Another person sent me one last night. They said, my life mission is to help mentor other followers of Jesus so they can become fully devoted disciples of Jesus. And I want to make sure God gets all the credit. Another person said, my God-sized mission is to share God's faithfulness with my story to my peers who suffer from health problems. One more. My God-sized mission, somebody sent us, is to live according to God's standards, to be an example to my children and then their children so that my family will glorify God in all that they do. Ooh, this is good stuff. Don't, don't, don't waddle home, even in your mind right now. Can, can you feel the wind of the Spirit beginning to, to take flight in your soul? I hope so, because these people and countless more, and maybe God is stirring in your heart, and it's not only going to make a difference in this world, this kind of stuff is going to make a different world. The world we pray for, I learned a prayer as a kid, it's in the Bible, thy will be done, Lord, on earth as it is in heaven heaven. And the realities of heaven can become the realities of earth when the Holy Spirit's wind blows and you begin to catch God's dream for your life. And today we are going to wrap up this series with a very important message about this. And we've been studying a man that's a Bible hero by the name of Moses. Many of you know who Moses is, right? You, you remember the story about when he was born as, as an enslaved child to Hebrew people in the land of Egypt. His mom saves his life. Do you remember how this story goes? She puts her, him in a basket, sends him down the Nile River. And you would think all hope would be lost at this point. But Pharaoh's daughter swoops him up and then takes him to the palace. And that's when the, the movie uh, title was given to him because he became the prince of Egypt. And there Moses grew up in this lap of luxury until one day he's out walking around and he sees his own Hebrew people being mistreated by an Egyptian guard and he takes matters into his own hands. I think he had an anger problem and he kills the guy who's abusing the slave. Well, now he's realizing, uh-oh, I've done something bad. And so he runs out of town 350 miles away and he ends up in a town called Midian. He meets a guy named Jethro, ends up marrying Jethro's daughter, good thing, and then he becomes a shepherd and that's where you think he's gonna live out his days. Until one day he's going along just minding his own business and God shows up. He gives him a God-sized dream and he caught his attention through a burning bush. And this voice came from the bush and I, I, I don't know uh, exactly how it all went down, but there's an old song about it that is Moses' God-sized dream. As I believe the Lord said essentially to Moses, go down Moses, way down to Egypt land, tell old Pharaoh, do you know the rest? Let my people go. And Moses did it. He did it. He went to see Pharaoh. And you know what? The people were eventually delivered. And they arrived to the edge of the promised land. And then Moses died. And then there's this really cool verse that summarizes Moses' life. Look with me at this verse. It comes from Deuteronomy 34, 7. Let's read it out loud together. Moses was 120 years old when he died. Yet his eyesight was clear and he was strong as ever. Now, check out this description of Moses. When he died, it says, his eyesight was clear and he was strong as ever. In other words, Moses was fully alive with a God-sized vision and enduring soul strength. He was fully alive until he was finally dead and he got to be with God. And this is a good description for life. Wouldn't you like this to be said of your life? I mean, this is really cool. You know, I'd love for uh, somebody to say at my funeral, you know, Wes, he, he, was, he was old when he, when he died. You know, I hope so. But his eyesight was clear, and he was strong as ever. That'd be good. I want to live my life with this God-sized vision. I want to live my life with this soul-deep strength throughout my life. And that's what Moses lived his life pursuing. And yet, you know what? This preaches really well. I'm having a good time. Y'all having fun? 
I'm having a good time. This is so much fun to, to tell you about this good news. And I thought this was the story of Moses. When I was in Sunday school, we had little felt boards, and we put uh, all this stuff together, little pictures, you know. And, and Moses' story seemed so neat, so pristine. That's why they made a cartoon about it, the Prince of Egypt. So cool. Did you ever read the actual story, though, in the Bible? Because it wasn't so nice. In fact, I used to think, oh, my God-sized dream is just going to be so nice. I'll be successful. Everybody will be happy. And then I'll die. And that verse will be said about me. The end. Right? But that's the stuff of fairy tales, isn't it? That's not actually what's in the Bible. We see in the Bible that uh, Moses' life, well, it was, it was a little bit more difficult. It reminds me of the show Behind the Music. You may ever watch this show on VH1? Behind the music. Okay, good. Nobody did. So um, anyway, there's a show. <laughs> I can tell you it's about anything, right? It, yeah. It was about me. <laughs> no, it wasn't. Um, it was about my favorite rock bands and pop stars, and, and they uh, would show their, their life of fame. And I loved it because all, Pastor George, all my favorite bands were there. The bands that Pastor George would not let me listen to on our church bus when I was in his youth group. ACDC, Van Halen. Uh, any other fans here? Led Zeppelin. Uh, oh, okay, okay. See, George, I told you people like that. And he didn't like my giant boom box that I would carry around with me, right? That's why I, I, I'm kind of short, is because that boom box I had with the 72D batteries that I put in there to listen to rock music. And I love this show because this show took you behind the lights and, and away from the adoring fans, and they told you what was happening behind the music. And can I tell you, it's a miracle any of these folks could get on the stage and sing. <laughs> I mean, just, you haven't seen the show, but believe me, your, your pop star idols, you know, you might want to check it out, their life. They, they really, it's a miracle. They could even complete a sentence, many of them. They face all kinds of difficulties. Today, we want to go behind the music of Moses' life. We want to go behind the Exodus because Moses experienced some difficulties and some obstacles and some challenges along the way. Now, why are we telling you this? I mean, we've been having such a good time talking about the ducks and music and, and God's dream for your life. What could be better? Well, you know what? We want to be honest with you. And that is that once you follow Jesus, can I tell you, if you, follow, if you accept Jesus in just a few minutes as your Lord and Savior, you can right now. You say, Lord, I need you. Oh, I need you. Every hour. Can I tell you that then you're, you're not just going to be able to walk out of here with every, without facing any trouble in your life? Jesus said, you know, in this world you're going to have trouble. Now take heart, I've overcome the world, he says. But in this world you'll have trouble. And when you go on your God-sized mission you might discover that you're going to have some trouble as well. At least Moses did. I haven't met anybody that hasn't. You have this great God-sized mission. I'm going to help children that have disabilities. What could be finer? And yet obstacles come, don't they? They came from Moses. Um, he experienced this when he goes to Pharaoh and he announces the news that God had told him to do. Guess what? Pharaoh's not impressed. Look with me at Exodus 5, 19 to 20. Because Moses... <laughs> He goes and tells Pharaoh, let my people go. And guess what? Mo, uh, Pharaoh doesn't let the people go. He doesn't. Instead, he turns up the heat and he makes the people work harder than ever. And so the Israelite foreman could see that they were in serious trouble when they were told, you must not reduce the number of bricks you make each day. As they left Pharaoh's court, they confronted Moses and Aaron who were waiting outside for them. Pharaoh had told them that they had to now make bricks without straw. Kind of a famous saying, bricks without straw. And the foreman come out to Moses. Now remember, this is Moses' own people that he's come to save. And they say, may the Lord judge you and punish you for making us stink before Pharaoh and his officials. You put a sword in their hands and an excuse to kill us. Well, if I'm Moses, I'm thinking, well, thanks a lot, you know. I've come and faced Pharaoh. I've got, I'm, I'm afraid of Pharaoh. I've come and faced him on the outside. And now I've got you people complaining. And you're complaining that you stink, really? Is that actually in the Bible? It is. I looked it up. <laughs> That's their complaint. You know, we're going to smell. We stink before Pharaoh. Well, Moses is catching all of this grief from within and without. And why are we telling you this? Because you're going to face difficulty in your life, even if God gives you a God-sized mission. In 1998, I, inspired by the Holy Spirit, I, I went out and did what Pastor George has been teaching us to do, 
kind of got a head start on that through the, uh, the leadership of another pastor in my life. And I sat down and I wrote my God-sized mission. To summarize it, it's to help uh, be a change agent for local churches to return to be all the Bible called the local church to be. That's my God-sized mission. That's why I love being one of your pastors, because this is such a great church, and I am honored to be here among you. Now, when I wrote that down in 1998, uh, one of the officials in the denomination that I um, am a part of, the United Methodist Church, called me. I'm in Kentucky. He says, I want you to someday, someday start a new church. I was like, cool. That fits my God-sized mission. And then uh, I finished my academic credentials I needed to do. So by January of 2002, I went back to see the guy. He says, you know what? Instead of starting a new church, we want you to take an existing church, go there as their new pastor, close down the church, and restart it as a brand new church. And I said, cool. This would be great. I'm thinking this fits my God-sized dream. Woohoo! this is amazing. Can I tell you, on my first Sunday, after we spent six months playing and, or praying and planning, my first Sunday I woke up early. I, went, I had gone and bought myself a new suit because I had to wear suits up there. And uh, so I'm wearing my new suit. I did my devotions. I reread my sermon. I walk up to the church on my first Sunday, and that's when I met Mary Sue. Mary Sue and her band of angry 80-year-olds <laughs> with their walkers and canes. And soon I realized that my God-sized dream was their collective nightmare. They said, we've heard about you, and we want you to know, and Mary Sue was their spokesperson, she said, we want you to know that this Sunday is going to be your last Sunday as our pastor. And I was like, but I, we don't even know each other. I mean, I haven't even had a chance to mess up yet. And she said, well, we've organized a boycott, and sure enough, they would go out and sit in their cars while I went inside to have church, you know, me and my wife and my son. So uh, we, we went in there, and they had this, all this going on, and I immediately uh, began to face this pressure from inside the people I'm supposed to lead. And when you know it, two of the pastors that were retired and part of that church, they soon brought me up on charges for breaking church law because I didn't give enough days announcing a meeting. Uh, that's actually in a church law book we have somewhere. Uh, it's 14 days you're supposed to do that for a meeting. Is that right, Pastor George? I don't want to mess it up again. 14 <laughs> days. And I gave people 13 days notice. 13 days notice, and I was in trouble. And so I'm, I'm fighting uh, the, the fears from the outside and, and, the, and the fighting with, from within, and I began to face discouragement, big time discouragement. And today, I think that's why I love the story of Moses, is because Moses, when he faced this discouragement, he found a way through. And let me say, if you today are facing discouragement, you can find a way through too. There is no need for you to waddle home in despair today. Because God in these moments together wants to give you wings with you you can fly. He wants to help you soar and no obstacle can hold you back. No wall can contain you. But we've got to follow the example of Moses. Let me share with you two things the teaching team found this week that answer this question. How do I persevere in my God-sized mission in the midst of discouragement? If you're discouraged today, I got some good news for you because Moses made it to the end of his life and slid into his grave with his eyesight, his vision intact, and his strength enduring and persevering. Here's how we can follow his example. First of all, cultivate a team. Cultivate a team. Moses was a heroic solo leader, and he was trying to do it all on his own. But guess what? Soon it became too much for him. Let me say, if your God-sized dream is something you can accomplish on your own, maybe go back and pray again. It might not be a God-sized dream. It might be just the start of something even bigger. And Moses finds himself at his wit's end as he's leading all these people out into the, the, the wilderness, and he's got to settle all these fights that are going on. It's difficult for him. And one day, his father-in-law Jethro comes and gives him some great advice. Look with me at the account in Exodus 18, verse 21. Jethro says, select from all the people some capable, honest men who fear God and hate bribes. Appoint them as leaders over groups of 1,000, 100, 50, and 10. They should always be available to solve the people's common disputes, but have them bring the major cases to you. Let the leaders decide the smaller matters themselves, and they will help you carry the load. Circle that. They will help you carry the load, making the task easier for you. If you follow this advice and if God commands you to do so, then you will be able to endure the pressures and all these people will go home in peace. 
See, what happens is this is a turning point in Moses' life as he becomes a team player. He then will have people around him, people like Caleb, people like Aaron, people like Joshua. And when this journey reaches the end of Moses' life, he's able to seamlessly hand off leadership to this guy, Joshua, that he'd mentored. Look with me at the account. It comes from Deuteronomy 34, verse 9. Now, Joshua, the son of Nun, was full of the spirit and wisdom, for Moses had laid his hands on him. So the people of Israel obeyed him, doing just as the Lord commanded Moses. So there's a seamless transition. Isn't this beautiful? Can I remind you that if you've been following Jesus for more than five minutes, and then when God gives you your God-sized mission, you're going to need a team. You need somebody with you. Bill Withers had it right. Lean on me when you're not strong. I'll be your friend. I'll help you carry on. We need that in our life. We've got three core values here at Grace Church. One is that we'd be, always be God-centered. Good value, don't you agree? People-focused, not surprising. But our third is this, that we'd be team-based. Team-based. And this comes from the Bible. Because the Bible doesn't call us to solo heroic religion. The Bible calls us to a, this dynamic community joined together by the grace of God where we can do life together, where we can lean on one another when we're not strong. In my life, when I was facing discouragement, one of the worst things that I did out of my own pride, frankly out of shame, out of self-reliance, self-deception, was to go and try to handle it on my own. you're facing discouragement today. Don't run away from community. Run to community. It breaks our hearts as your pastors when we see somebody going through trouble and then they just disappear. We can't find them. and we're, We go searching for them many times if we can. We say, what are you doing? Don't run away. When you need the people of God most, you need people to be able to speak that hope into your life once again. Moses needed it. In fact, Jesus modeled it. Look with me at what the Gospel of Luke says about Jesus. Actually, we're going to talk about that in just a minute. He modeled this as well. You remember Jesus got together the disciples? He had a team with him. You need a team of people. Look with me at the second insight we gained from Moses' life. How to persevere in the face of discouragement means you and I, we must cultivate our relationship with God. Constantly be cultivating our relationship with God. Moses enjoyed this constant communion with God to the point that the Bible said that they would actually meet together face to face. Do you have that deep, personal, intimate relationship with God? If not, today's the day to begin that relationship. And if you're facing discouragement, you can pray the prayer that was just sung, Lord, I need you. Oh, I need you. Every hour I need you. Moses he didn't rely on himself anymore. He relied on others, but he relied on God. Look with me at Exodus 19. The Bible says that one day Moses climbed the mountain to appear before God, and the Lord called to him from the mountain and said, Give these instructions to the family of Jacob. Announce it to the descendants of Israel. You see how Moses, when he was in trouble, he went to be with God. Many times when we're in trouble, we run away from people, but if you're like me, you run away from God too. Don't run away from God. Run to God in those times of trouble. Jesus modeled this for us. As I mentioned, he modeled community, but he also modeled this communion with God. Luke 6, 12 tells us that one day soon afterward, Jesus went up to a mountain to pray, and he prayed to God all night. When Jesus was facing discouragement because he had pressures coming at him from all directions, he went to be with his heavenly Father. Because at the end of the day, can I tell you what your life is about? It's not about you. It's about God. So many times in my difficult days of discouragement, do you know what the problem is? Is I'm taking God's dream and I'm making it Wes's dream. I'm making it, I'm making it Wes's mission. And that's not at all what it was designed to be. If you want to persevere, you need people around you. You need a team. You need to cultivate this ongoing, deep, personal, intimate relationship with God. 
Anybody here this week been watching the Olympics? Anybody started watching the Olympics? Yep, our family has, has too been taking those in, and it reminded me of my favorite Olympic story that happened long ago in the Mexico City when they were hosting the Olympics in 1968. There was uh, the marathon, and the way that it was set out is that the marathon runners would come into the stadium at the end, and everybody could cheer, and the race was over, so it seemed. For a guy from Ethiopia had won about an hour before this amazing scene took place. When the crowd was starting to leave, all of a sudden they could hear police sirens, and they found these escort cars uh, coming towards the gate. And there the few remaining fans could see that there was one lone runner still going after everybody else had finished the race. John Stephen Aquari, wearing the colors of Tanzania, came limping into the stadium, bloody from a fall that had happened hours earlier. And here he is on mile 26, finishing this race by coming into the Olympic Stadium. Well, soon the remaining crowd began to cheer. And they began to cheer him as he made his way all the way around to the finish line. A reporter made his way up to John Stephen and said, why are you doing this? It's dark. Everybody's going home. You're coming in last. And John Stephen said, my country did not send me 7,000 miles to just start a race. My country sent me here to finish. People of God, God wants to give you a God-sized mission. And no matter how noble the task that God has set before you, God doesn't want you to just start it. He wants you to finish it, to finish it to the applause of heaven so that when you arrive on your last day, the day that you're going to meet Jesus Christ face to face, your body might be broken down, but you're going to slide into your grave filled with vision and filled with soul-enduring strength as you persevere no matter what may come. Let's stand for prayer. Lord, we need you. Every hour we need you. And for those here today who are discouraged, for those of us that are facing difficulties from seemingly all sides, we pray that, Lord, you would come and draw us to yourself. Unite us with fellow brothers and sisters in Christ that we might be able to finish the race, the course you set out before us. Lord, we know that the prize is wonderful and we know that your Holy Spirit is with us and we thank you that you're with us today. Amen. Friends, if today you'd like to say yes to Jesus and begin this journey with him as your Lord and Savior, I'll be over here at the cross. If today you want to come to the altar, maybe you're discouraged and today's the day you want to come, you want somebody to pray with you, lift a hand. Let's worship the Lord together through song.